Excellent! On May 6th, NVIDIA announced two new graphics cards, the GTX 1080 and GTX 1070, and even though they only shared limited information with the public, the tech world has spent the last couple weeks drooling and speculating over the new GPUs. NVIDIA made some bold claims, including that both cards are faster than the Titan X, but one claim in particular stuck with me. That the new 1080 is faster than two previous generation GTX 980s in SLI. Since my water cooled computer back there uses this exact configuration, I took it as a challenge, perhaps even an insult by Nvidia, so I'm here today to set the record straight. Is the 1080 faster than two 980s in SLI? Actually, I don't care about that. Normal 980s are for poor people. Is the 1080 faster than the Arctic Panther? Let's find out. So since this video is also my GTX 1080 review, I'm going to cover four main topics. First is going to be a recap of what we learned from the launch event a couple weeks back. Second will be a summary of some of the new specs and technologies that we're now allowed to talk about. Third will be some benchmarks, of course. And fourth, some quick overclocking. So what we already knew about the GTX 1080 was this. It will cost $600 MSRP, or $700 if you get the Founders Edition. It uses the 60 nanometer 7.2 billion transistor Pascal-based GP104 GPU and has 8 gigs of GDDR5X memory. It has a base clock of 1607 megahertz and a boost of 1734, and Nvidia demoed an overclocked card at their event running at 2.1 gigahertz. Uh, it, that was pretty impressive. It has 2,560 CUDA cores, a 180-watt thermal design power, and a newly designed air cooler on the Founders Edition that I have here. Uh, it's got a similar look to the previous gen reference cards, but now it features more triangles. Uh, in my launch video, I also went over Ansel, NVIDIA's in-game picture-taking software, VRWorks Audio for more realistic positional audio in VR, and Simultaneous Multi-Projection, which is built into the hardware of the 1080 and 1070. It uses virtual viewports to more accurately and efficiently render multi-monitor configurations, VR games, and other unique types of displays. Now let's move on to the new technologies. I'm actually kind of surprised you haven't skipped ahead to the benchmarks yet, so thanks for sticking with me. Since you're still here, let's take a closer look at this particular Founders Edition 1080. The new cooler has a die-cast aluminum body and a low-profile backplate. Half of that backplate can be removed to provide more airflow and multi-card setups. Functionally, it's the same as the 980 Ti cooler. It's got a blower-style fan. It's got an aluminum fin array over a vapor chamber that keeps the GPU memory and everything down there cool. Just a single 8-pin PCI Express graphics power connector is required and you can power up to four displays via the video outs. You get three DisplayPort 1.2 ports that NVIDIA says are forward compatible with DisplayPort 1.3 and 1.4. You get one HDMI 2.0B and one dual-link DVI-I. Note that there are no anal analog connections on this card at all. New display connection standards allow you to take advantage of the 1080's 12-bit display controller and handle 4K resolution at 60Hz for HEVC encoding and decoding. HEVC is H.265, by the way, it's effectively the successor to H.264. And uh, DisplayPort 1.4, by the way, also includes HDR metadata transport for connecting to new HDR displays. And not that you have an 8K display, but Pascal does also support that. 7680 by 4320 maximum resolution at 60Hz, although that does require two DisplayPort 1.3 connections. Anyway, let's move on to some of the more abstract things that NVIDIA has done to wring as much possible performance out of the 1080 as possible. Memory compression. That's uh, like taking a lot of data and making it smaller, basically, right? So now NVIDIA features 4 to 1 and 8 to 1 compression methods to reduce the number of bytes of data that have to be fetched from the memory to render each frame. That's pretty cool. Asynchronous compute. That was uh, actually asked about a lot after the original announcement. So if you consider a GPU's workloads, there's the graphics processing, and then there's other stuff like GPU-based physics, post-processing of rendered frames, and asynchronous time warp. Which that's part of VR rendering. It checks your head's position at the last possible moment before it spits out the final frame. Pascal's dynamic load balancing allows the GPU to reallocate its resources on the fly to handle time-critical asynchronous workloads or to simply use all of the GPU's idle resources. They've also introduced something called thread level preemption and pixel level preemption, which allows the GPU to essentially hit pause on whatever it's working on, even in the middle of rasterizing a single polygon, for example, and switch tasks in less than 100 microseconds to handle a time-critical asynchronous task. Finally, there's simultaneous multi-projection, single-pass stereo, and lens-matched shading, all of which I discussed in the launch event video that I already did, so go watch that if you want more info on that. I'm not going to rehash it here. Let's just say they all make VR a better experience. Anyway, though, it's time for benchmarks at last. 
everything here is going to be run at 4K, and I will be including numbers for the GTX 1080, of course, as well as the GTX 980 Ti and the AMD Radeon Fury X reference cards. These will all run in an open test bed that's right back there, except, of course, the Arctic Panther. That's two-way GTX 980s. It's enclosed and water-cooled and overclocked to about 1545 per GPU. The test bed is an Intel Core i7-5930K CPU at 4.4 GHz, 16 GB of G-Skill Rip Jaws 4 2666-speed DDR4 memory, an EVGA X99 classified motherboard, and a HyperX Savage 240GB SSD. Enjoy! Clearly the Arctic Panther wins. End of story. I'm not even going to mention the GTA 5 score. We're all we're all done here. Okay. All right. Fine. Let's uh, let's try another game that doesn't scale quite as well, and that will also let us take a look at some DirectX 12 performance, since that's something other people also asked for. Rise of the Tomb Raider. So I won't attempt to explain the differences between DirectX 11 and DirectX 12 here, but it's safe to say that DirectX 12 is not yet the magic bullet that will just give you free game performance. The few games that support it still show poorer performance than DirectX 11 for now, but we'll hopefully see optimization on the software and driver side that changes that later this year. So I'm sure people are already mad that I didn't overclock the 1080, even though my 980s are pretty heavily juiced, so here's a quick look at the beta version of EVGA Precision X16 for overclocking a 1080. You still get your options to adjust power target, temperature target, and GPU and memory clock offsets. There's voltage control too, but GPU, GPU Boost 3.0 is the most exciting thing here in my opinion. Consider if you will that every GPU is a little, little different, even one 1080 versus another 1080, but every GPU has a maximum theoretical frequency that it, it could hit at any given voltage without any issues. GPU Boost 2.0 would start off with a given voltage and frequency, and then ramp both of those up in a linear fashion until it hits a threshold, such as a temperature limit for example. GPU Boost 3.0 allows you to create a custom voltage frequency curve with a different frequency setting for each voltage point, so you can maximize your performance. They've even included an OC scanner utility, which will run through a stress test for you to automatically set up a custom voltage frequency curve specific to your GPU automatically. Unfortunately, it didn't work that great for me. It kept locking up. But again, we're working with the beta utility right now, so we got to give them a little, little wiggle room there. I was still able to overclock the old-fashioned way, though, and I pushed my GTX 1080 initially up to over 2.1 GHz, but then settled back to a more comfortable 2085 MHz. This gave the 1080 about a 500-point boost in Firestrike Ultra. Impressive for sure, but still not enough to beat the Arctic Panther. <laughs> But did I mention that in all of these benchmarks, the testbed with the GTX 1080 only pulled about 305 watts maximum from the wall socket? Closest competitor was the 980 Ti, which pulled about 370, then the Fury X, which pulled about 400, and finally the Arctic Panther at 670 watts, but it's, it's a full system and water cooling and dual GPU and all that stuff. But anyway, clearly the 1080 is absolutely awesome, as it can kick all that ass and do it while consuming less power. Before I conclude though, let's talk about this SLI situation that has so many jimmies rustled out there. First of all, yes, there is a new high bandwidth SLI bridge and it's only made for two-way configurations. Standard bridges will still work, but they're only recommended for resolutions up to 2560 by 1440 at 60 Hz. Rigid SLI bridges that have LEDs built into them that already exist will work up to 4K, and then NVIDIA software will also tell you what kind of bridge it detects that you're using. More to the point though, three-way and four-way SLI are still going to be there, but you will have to take some extra steps to enable it by running an NVIDIA app to detect and generate a signature for your GPUs, request an enthusiast key from a website that NVIDIA will be setting up, and then install the key to unlock the three-way and four-way functions. Does this mean that 3-way and 4-way SLI configs will be going away? Probably not. Does it mean that NVIDIA will be less obligated to support them? I kind of think so. But consider that DirectX 12 and VR introduced some interesting new multi-GPU options, such as using, using a single GPU for each eye in VR, or display adapter modes that allows you to pool the memory from both GPUs. NVIDIA's choice was to focus more on developing these configurations, since 3-way and 4-way SLI are very, very rare setups. 
You guys are free to continue arguing about this now, since I'm sure there are two sides of the story and you guys might have opinions one way or the other, but at least now you really know what's going on. That is all for this review though guys, if you enjoyed it, I strongly encourage you to hit the like button down there, and of course if you want to help support me even more, you can use my Amazon link, which is down in the description. Click it before you shop for stuff at Amazon, that helps me a lot. Also feel free to visit my store, store.paulsarber.net, where you can pick up shirts like this one, also mugs and pint glasses. Subscribe to my channel if you're not already for more tech videos, and as always, thank you for watching. The closest competitor to that was the 980Ti doing about 370 watts, Fury X did about 400 watts, Arctic Panther pulled about 670, but you know, two ways. <laughs>